Chapter 271, A Victory and a Secret After some negotiation with Blake, Snape ended up empty-handed. All the basilisk remains were claimed by Blake. The reason was straightforward, Snape had no use for them. Despite his extensive knowledge of potion recipes, none required basilisk parts. The idea of experimenting to discover new potion properties and develop innovative formulas was easier said than done. Only someone as uniquely talented as Blake could find such research as simple as eating. Snape, despite his considerable skill in potion making, couldn't compete with Blake's unconventional methods. Moreover, without Blake's insight, Snape wouldn't have even considered the basilisk materials valuable. Consequently, Snape felt utterly outmaneuvered, a frustration not even three bottles of joy potion could alleviate. Now that the basilisk issue is resolved, Dumbledore began, sitting behind his desk with a visible sense of relief, we can expect the students to return after the holiday without concern. Professor McGonagall, too, shared a smile. The fear of a monster lurking within the school had weighed heavily on everyone's hearts. Now, with the matter settled, relief was palpable. However, there's still the matter of the school board, McGonagall mentioned, her worry resurfacing. It's under control, Minerva, Dumbledore reassured her. They are aware of the situation, but we've kept it from becoming public knowledge. The board agrees that revealing the existence of the Basilisk and the Chamber of Secrets could tarnish Hogwarts' reputation. Dumbledore's expression turned grave. In the past, he might have used the incident to highlight Blake's achievements. However, the emergence of Grindelwald's Nurmengard Magic Academy openly competing for students changed the stakes. Revealing the basilisk could incite fear of other hidden dangers, potentially driving students to Nurmengard. Thus, the decision was made to keep the chamber and its monster a secret. A polite knock on the oak door interrupted their discussion. Please come in, Dumbledore invited. Blake entered, a broad grin on his face. You've never knocked before, Dumbledore observed, a hint of amusement in his voice. Perhaps I'm in an exceptionally good mood today, Blake replied, his smile so wide his eyes were nearly closed. The basilisk had provided him with valuable materials, especially the potent venom, far stronger than any toxin he had encountered before. No wonder it could destroy Horcruxes. It seems Severus assisted you with the basilisk? Dumbledore inquired. Indeed, Blake recalled Snape's reluctant assistance in the Chamber of Secrets, which only added to his amusement. Dumbledore chuckled, understanding the dynamic between the two. I have no objections to you taking the basilisk remains. Severus has informed me of your new potion formula. I hope you'll continue to excel. In that moment, Dumbledore was not the century's greatest wizard but a proud elder, encouraging a promising young talent. Don't worry, I will definitely continue to push the boundaries, Blake assured him, his enthusiasm undimmed by the challenges ahead. Make this legacy left by Slytherin play its due role. Hearing Blake refer to the basilisk as Slytherin's legacy, Dumbledore couldn't help but feel a bit helpless, though he couldn't deny the accuracy of the statement. You always have your own way of thinking, Blake. I advised you against rushing in today, yet you proceeded and even managed to swiftly deal with the basilisk. It's time I acknowledge your capabilities. I've always wanted to protect you, but it seems I really shouldn't have. Dumbledore's words were filled with genuine astonishment at Blake's actions that evening. He had come to the realization that it was time to start treating Blake as an accomplished adult wizard, rather than the inexperienced second-year student he appeared to be. Blake's prowess was indeed commendable. Well, you can now go home and enjoy your vacation, Dumbledore continued. You have two and a half days off. I believe Miss Worley or Miss Granger would be delighted to have you visit. Blake's smile momentarily stiffened. Ahem, of course. But let's not forget what needs to be done before we can enjoy the holiday. Are you referring to Hagrid? Dumbledore inquired. Yes, I believe it's time for Hagrid's name to be cleared, Blake said, pulling out a cube-shaped glass container from his pocket. Inside the container was a massive yellow eyeball. Is that a basilisk's eye? Dumbledore noticed the marks on the eyeball. Indeed. When the Ministry of Magic sees this, they should understand what truly killed Myrtle, Blake explained, placing the basilisk's eyeball on Dumbledore's desk. 
As long as we discreetly inform the relevant authorities about the Chamber of Secrets, we can keep the incident under wraps. That's excellent. Dumbledore's face lit up with relief. With this evidence, Hagrid's innocence will undoubtedly be proven. That's the plan. But remember, I'm lending this to you, and I'll need it back eventually, Blake added. Don't worry, do you think I would mishandle your belongings? Dumbledore replied with a chuckle. Besides, this item is of no use to anyone but you. After receiving a satisfactory response, Blake was about to leave when something caught his eye, causing the corners of his mouth to turn up slightly. The sorting hat was dozing off, pondering over the song it would sing at the next year's sorting ceremony, when it suddenly felt a chill. Opening its eyes, it saw Blake, the last person it wanted to encounter. Ahem, good day, Blake. Is there something you need from me? The sorting hat stammered, clearly nervous. I must warn you, my abilities are limited, and I may not be of much help. Blake's interest in the sorting hat wasn't because he needed its assistance. He remembered that the sword of Gryffindor could be summoned through this hat, though he wasn't sure if the sword was actually hidden inside it or if the hat merely acted as a conduit. The sorting hat was now visibly anxious, especially since Blake hadn't responded and was giving it a rather unsettling look. Dumbledore, noticing Blake's interest in the hat, couldn't help but be curious. What's the matter? he asked. Blake replied, When I walked past the sorting hat, I sensed something unusual about it. A spider, perhaps? Dumbledore asked, somewhat puzzled. Blake was surprised by Dumbledore's question. Didn't Dumbledore know about the hat's connection to the sword of Gryffindor? It seemed unlikely. If Blake hadn't intervened, it would have been Harry, facing the basilisk. Fox had sensed Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore and sent him the sorting hat, from which he drew the sword to slay the beast. It appeared that Dumbledore might not have been aware that Fox's act of sending the hat was entirely its own initiative, motivated by Harry's loyalty. The Sword of Gryffindor So, it was Fox who revealed that the Sword of Gryffindor was concealed within the sorting hat. Blake realized that further speculation was futile. He lifted the ancient hat and despite the sorting hat's continuous grumbling, began a thorough examination. Hmm. Nothing? Blake scrutinized every crease of the sorting hat, finding no magic that could conceal objects. Just as he was about to consult Fox, a realization struck him. The Sword of Gryffindor, it appears only to those who truly embody the virtues of Gryffindor, and only in their time of need. Blake felt he possessed at least a trace of Gryffindor's bravery. So with renewed determination, he reached into the sorting hat. Oh, please don't. It tickles, though a little scratch here and there feels rather nice. The sorting hat murmured, sounding surprisingly content. As Blake delved deeper, his skill and performance mastery was triggered, enhancing the fervent hypnosis in his mind. With a clumency, he magnified this emotion exponentially. I'm in peril and require assistance. I've encountered an insurmountable obstacle. If only there was something here to aid me. Suddenly, Blake's fingers brushed against a cold, hard object. Overjoyed, he grasped the sword's hilt and pulled with all his might. With a resonant clang, he extracted an exquisite silver sword adorned with red gems from the sorting hat. Oh, that feels wonderful, the sorting hat exclaimed, sounding blissfully relieved. I've always felt something was amiss over the years. It turns out this was inside me all along. Blake, holding the sword, felt a surge of triumph. His desire for the sword wasn't out of need, but from the satisfaction of unraveling a mystery. Ding! A shock emotion detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for acquiring a golden treasure chest. Dumbledore, observing from the sidelines, gazed at the sword in astonishment. This is the Sword of Gryffindor. This sword has been lost for many years. I never imagined it was hidden within the hat. The Sword of Gryffindor, feeling somewhat indignant, thought to itself, Where's the promised danger? Where's the promised challenge? I've been duped. This unexpected turn of events left everyone in awe as Blake stood there, the legendary sword in hand, a testament to his ingenuity and the mysterious ways of the magical world. Chapter 272 Mr. Worley Must I discuss my little cotton-padded jacket's leak? Dumbledore carefully took the sword from Blake's grasp, examining it with a keen eye. I was aware that after Gryffindor's passing the goblins sought to reclaim this sword, he began. 
subsequently, it vanished within the confines of Hogwarts. Many speculated that the goblins had indeed retrieved it. However, I've always held the belief that the sword remained here, merely concealed in a location beyond our discovery. I never anticipated it was hidden within the sorting hat. Wait, it appears I was mistaken. Upon closer inspection, a look of realization dawned on Dumbledore's face. I understand now. The sword wasn't hidden in the hat after all. It resides in a secret place, accessible only through a special teleportation magic. The sorting hat merely serves as a conduit to summon it. Once the sword is teleported, the magic enabling its movement vanishes. It seems that only those who truly embody the spirit of Gryffindor can call upon it through the hat and successfully retrieve it. This must have been difficult for you to discern. Dumbledore cast a puzzled glance at Blake, who simply smiled in response. It's just a hunch. I've had these odd intuitions ever since I can remember, Blake explained, attributing the unexplainable to his gut feeling. Dumbledore didn't dwell on it further. Blake's life was filled with enough magical anomalies that one more super-accurate intuition hardly seemed out of place. I've examined this sword and noticed it possesses a peculiar property akin to a base metal, Blake mentioned, setting the sorting hat aside and taking the sword of Gryffindor back from Dumbledore. It has the unique ability to absorb substances that can fortify it. Blake produced a small glass bottle containing a dark green liquid. Upon opening it, he gestured with his hand, and a drop of the liquid flew from the bottle, landing on the sword's blade. Miraculously, the liquid vanished upon contact. What is that? Dumbledore inquired, intrigued. Basilisk venom, Blake revealed. Dare I ask if you've neutralized the poison? No, Blake clarified. The sword only assimilates what enhances its strength. The basilisk venom I possess does precisely that. Thus, the sword absorbed it upon contact. Dumbledore questioned. Will the sword retain the venom's toxicity? No, the sword itself isn't poisonous. It merely absorbed the venom's destructive capabilities. For instance, if it couldn't destroy Horcruxes before, it now possesses the enhanced power to do so, Blake elucidated. Is that so? Dumbledore murmured, retrieving a crown from his robes and taking the sword from Blake once more. Let's test the sword. This Horcrux holds no value to you, correct? Professor, please reconsider. That's a historical artifact, Blake protested, attempting to dissuade Dumbledore's impulsive action. Even so, to obliterate the Horcrux, we must. I can extract its residual soul without damaging the artifact, Blake interjected, placing his palm on the crown and drawing out a dark mist. However, since Blake had sealed the Horcrux using undead magic, Voldemort's remnant soul remained dormant within the mass of black energy, unmoving. This sword cannot sever a soul, Dumbledore noted with a hint of disappointment, handing the sword back to Blake. He then pointed the Elder Wand at the Black Mist, and with a flick, an orange-red flame emerged, incinerating the Black Mist instantly. Dumbledore's use of Gubraithian fire demonstrated its own destructive power, akin to the enhanced sword's capabilities. In the realm of magical curses, the fire curse stands out for its lethal potency, capable of inflicting damage that not even a soul body can evade. Dumbledore, a master of Gubraithian fire, recognized the spark of understanding in Blake's eyes and remarked, I had planned to introduce you to this spell in a few years, but it seems you've already mastered it on your own, haven't you? After his meeting with the headmaster, Blake utilized a dim, ancional gate to send Nagini safely back home. Dumbledore, preoccupied with Hagrid's rehabilitation and bogged down by the Ministry of Magic's notorious inefficiency, found himself unable to return home for the foreseeable future. Left to his own devices, Blake decided against visiting Hermione or Cassandra, fully aware that his presence could potentially cause more trouble than it was worth especially considering the explosive potential of revealing his whereabouts to certain individuals. Determined to continue his magical explorations, Blake used the dimensional door to access the Room of Requirement in a manner unique to him. The room, ever responsive to the desires of its visitors, transformed itself according to Blake's wishes without requiring him to lift a finger. In no time, a new door appeared, leading to an empty laboratory that soon filled with various materials Blake retrieved from his system warehouse, treasures collected from numerous adventures. With a new blueprint in hand and the Gubraithian fire at his command, 
Blake embarked on an ambitious, alchemical project. By the next day, a massive oval-shaped glass container, a biological petri dish, stood completed in the laboratory. This device, a pinnacle of ultimate biotechnology, was designed to recreate life forms from their genetic materials, a capability Blake had yet to explore due to previous constraints. Now, with an ample supply of basilisk blood at his disposal, Blake contemplated the possibility of cultivating a new basilisk. However, the basilisk from the Chamber of Secrets, with its formidable but uncontrollable gaze, was deemed a flawed specimen by Blake's standards. If he were to undertake this project, he aimed to create a basilisk that was not only more powerful, but also under his control, avoiding the pitfalls of creating an uncontrollable monster, as often depicted in Tales of Pandora's Box. Undeterred by the potential risks, Blake proceeded to pour a small bottle of basilisk blood into the petri dish, supplementing it with the blood of other formidable creatures, including a great black dragon, a venomous leopard, and even the mythical hydra. As days and nights passed, the holiday season dwindled and Blake remained engrossed in his laboratory, on the cusp of unleashing a new era of magical discovery. Blake had to leave in secrecy, as per Dumbledore's request. He made a show of heading home, only to circle back and catch the train to Hogwarts. Despite the absence of others, the biological petri dish in his lab continued its work autonomously. Without the necessary activation from Blake, the creatures within remained dormant, unable to awaken on their own. Shortly after Blake stepped through the dimensional door to leave, the mass of unidentified tissue in the Patri dish began to quiver ominously. Upon arriving at King's Cross Station, Blake was immediately confronted by a man. Um. Hello, Mr. Worley, Blake greeted, managing a strained smile despite the unease he felt. Mr. Worley's expression was grim, causing Blake to fear the worst, that Mr. Rye, Worley had come to confront him over some grievance. Suddenly, Mr. Worley grasped Blake's right hand firmly. Well, Blake began, puzzled by Mr. Worley's unexpectedly enthusiastic handshake. This, Mr. Worley? What's going on? Oh, no, it's nothing. I was just utterly astonished by the magic of your unique sunflowers. You're truly remarkable, Mr. Worley exclaimed, his face alight with excitement. Is it really just about expressing your admiration? Blake asked, his suspicion evident. Absolutely. Mr. Worley assured him with a grave tone. Yet, Blake couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to Mr. Worley's actions. Deciding to probe deeper, he discreetly employed his advanced legitimacy skills. The thoughts he uncovered were a mix of resignation and disbelief. Do I, the head of the Worley family, really have to be coerced by my own daughter into apologizing to a young boy? And do I have to admit it to him? Oh, but since that hairy boy is you, I suppose it's accept. Table. Blake was rendered speechless by Mr. Worley's internal monologue, filled with a mixture of sorrow and reluctant acceptance. The encounter at King's Cross Station had taken an unexpected turn, revealing the complexities of adult pride and the unexpected impact of his magical creations on the lives of others. Chapter 273 Misunderstandings and Apologies Mr. Worley found himself in a predicament he had never anticipated. Previously, he couldn't understand why, after merely glaring at Blake, his daughter Cassandra suddenly became distant towards him. Moreover, his wife's reaction to the peculiar sunflower Cassandra brought home, followed by secretive conversations, only added to his confusion. During Cassandra's three-day vacation at home, Mr. Welf Worley felt an inexplicable tension within his own household. Gradually, through snippets of conversations with his wife, Mr. Worley pieced together the situation. It all began when he unintentionally intimidated Blake with a glare, just as Cassandra was about to invite Blake over. This reaction had not only upset his daughter, but also made his wife feel guilty for potentially ruining Cassandra's chance with a young man of considerable talent and even better background than their own. Blake, known for his exceptional skills in herbal medicine and the creation of a new magical plant with immense potential, had caught the interest of Cassandra. Yet, Mr. Worley's glare had inadvertently driven him away at a crucial moment. Learning that Blake nearly left for another girl because of this incident, Mrs. Worley was adamant that they couldn't let a misunderstanding drive a wedge between Blake and their family. Realizing his mistake, Mr. Worley knew he had to make amends. He decided to apologize to Blake, 
hoping to mend the situation without further embarrassment. However, Blake, having already understood the entire situation through legitimacy, couldn't help but smirk at Mr. Worley's dilemma. When confronted, Blake feigned sadness, claiming he understood Mr. Worley's concerns and would distance himself from Cassandra, believing himself unworthy of her company. He even offered his technological investments as parting gifts. Before Mr. Worley could clarify his intentions, Blake swiftly departed, leaving him flustered and alone. In a moment of realization, Mr. Worley understood the gravity of his mistake. If Blake truly distanced himself from Cassandra and severed ties with the Worley family, Mr. Worley himself would be the one to blame. Desperate to rectify the situation, he chased after Blake, lamenting the misunderstanding. Mr. Worley's pursuit was not just about correcting a misunderstanding, it was about overcoming the protective instincts of a father. He realized that his initial annoyance with Blake was a natural reaction to seeing his daughter grow up and form connections outside the family. However, he also recognized the need to adapt and support Cassandra's choices. As Mr. Worley chased after Blake, calling out for him to stop, he hoped to convey his true intentions and apologize for the misunderstanding. He realized that his actions, though stemming from a place of concern, had been misinterpreted, leading to an unnecessary rift. Now, he was determined to set things right, not just for his daughter's happiness, but for the harmony of their family. After a prolonged and futile chase, Mr. Worley found himself gasping for breath, despairing at his inability to catch up. Not every wizard is blessed with physical prowess, and Blake, it seemed, was among those who were. His figure quickly vanished into the crowd, leaving Mr. Worley to lament his failure. You little rascal, why must you run so swiftly? Listen to me, I'm seething with anger. Mr. Worley panted, his voice tinged with frustration. Did you do this deliberately? He called out, but to no avail. Exhausted, he could only watch as Blake disappeared from sight. Meanwhile, Blake, having put a considerable distance between himself and Mr. Worley, took a moment to tidy his disheveled hair before leisurely settling down at a roadside dessert shop. He ordered a strawberry sundae, a small reward for the chaos he had inadvertently caused. Ahem, it's not that I'm heartless. How could I possibly ignore such an opportunity to gain treasure? Blake mused to himself, enjoying his dessert. This is all just a big misunderstanding. I'm sure once everything is explained, Mr. Worley won't hold a grudge. After all, we're practically family, and a little deception among family members is normal, right? Unbeknownst to Blake, Cassandra and Mrs. Worley were observing the scene from a distance. They hadn't intended for Mr. Worley to chase Blake down. They simply hoped Mr. Worley would show some kindness towards the young herbalist prodigy. After all, Blake had contributed significantly to the Worley family business, and it would be unwise to alienate him over a misunderstanding. As Mr. Worley approached Blake, the initial interaction seemed promising. However, the situation quickly deteriorated. The handshake between them was followed by a few whispered words from Mr. Worley, which caused Blake's expression to shift dramatically, from shock to realization, then to sadness, and finally resignation. What did Dad say to Blake? Why does he look so upset? Cassandra whispered, concern evident in her voice. Mrs. Worley's response was uncertain, her voice fading as she spoke. If Mr. Worley hadn't said anything too harsh, why would Blake react so strongly? The situation escalated when Blake suddenly turned and ran, prompting Mr. Worley to give chase once more, this time with a determination that suggested he might not stop until he had caught up. This is terrible. This could seriously offend him. Mrs. Worley murmured, watching the scene unfold with a sense of dread. Dad, how could he? Cassandra couldn't hide her disbelief. Blake had not only saved her life, but had also been a benefactor to their family. The thought of her father acting so aggressively towards him was unfathomable. As Mr. Worley disappeared into the crowd in pursuit of Blake, he was oblivious to the shocked and disappointed expressions of his wife and daughter. All he could think about was catching Blake unaware of the emotional turmoil he had caused. Little rascal, why run? Can't you just listen to what I have to say? You're going to be the death of me. Mr. Worley's voice trailed off into the distance, filled with a mix of frustration and desperation. Detected that the target's treasure chest drops today have reached the upper limit, announced a voice. Ding. 
This target will not drop a treasure chest again today. Blake set down his cup and stood up, leaving the dessert shop behind. Really, you must believe me. All I did was shake his hand and compliment his sunflower. Mr. Worley's voice trailed off as he tried to explain himself, but it was clear that his audience was skeptical. Two women, one older and one younger, fixed him with their large emerald green eyes, clearly doubting his story. Putting himself in their shoes, Mr. Worley realized he wouldn't believe his own explanation either. But, I truly am innocent, he lamented. The sound of the train whistle indicated that the Hogwarts Express was ready to depart. Cassandra, in a panic, reported, Blake isn't in the car. I don't know where he is. Cassandra, calm down, Mrs. Worley said firmly, shooting a glare at Mr. Worley, who looked pale and distressed. Blake will be all right. I'll write to Professor Dumbledore to clear up this misunderstanding. The train is about to leave, dear. You should board now. I promise we'll find Blake. As the train pulled away from Platform 9 and 3 quarters, Mrs. Worley watched until it disappeared around a bend. She then turned to Mr. Worley. I, everything I said is true. You have to believe me, he whispered, a mix of desperation and hope in his voice. Okay, I know you're not lying, Mrs. Worley replied with a gentle smile. Ah, you, you believe me? But earlier you... Mr. Worley was overwhelmed with relief. And why did you treat that child so poorly, she asked. It was the child's way of getting back at you, she revealed. Ah, I, you mean he deliberately tricked me? Mr. Worley was astounded. What else? Mrs. Worley said, her emerald green eyes sparkling with insight. Ah, next time I see him, I'll make him regret it, Mr. Worley fumed, the realization hitting him hard. Alas, don't you see? Blake tricked you today as a form of revenge, Mrs. Worley explained. Think about it. After today, Cassandra will doubt any negative comments you make about Blake. Furthermore, she'll prevent you from doing anything to harm him. From now on, you won't even be able to scold him. Mr. Worley stared at his wife in shock, finally understanding the depth of Blake's cunning. What a sly boy. While deceiving me and seeking revenge, he also convinced Cassandra that I'm biased against him. I can't say anything bad about him in the future. Mr. Worley grumbled, realizing the predicament he was in. When I see him again, not only can I not be angry, but I'll have to treat him kindly. The thought of his efforts over the years being undone by someone he considered unworthy made Mr. Worley's blood boil. To think I have to praise the very person who's caused me so much trouble. Mr. Worley felt his blood pressure rising, a testament to the day's unexpected and frustrating turn of events. Chapter 274 Cassandra, you misunderstood. In fact, my father has facial paralysis. Ding! Anxiety and worry detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for receiving a silver treasure chest. Huh? Blake paused in a secluded alley, about to use the dimension gate to board the bus directly. His actions halted abruptly as he noticed a significant decrease in the expected arrival of treasure chests. Could it be that I've been discovered? The missing treasure chests likely belong to Mrs. Worley. Initially, a few were granted, but then, the expected influx ceased. This indicated Mrs. Worley had caught on to his intentions. As for Mr. Worley, he had already maxed out his contributions. Most of the current treasure chests were courtesy of Cassandra. Ah, that makes sense. No wonder Cassandra is so astute. She must have inherited it from her mother. At that moment, Mr. Worley, who had just exited the station, sneezed loudly. Could it be that the little rascal took advantage of me, and now he's cursing me behind my back? Meanwhile, Hermione was perplexed. Despite searching numerous carriages, she couldn't find Blake. She wondered if he had gone to school on his own, a possibility that wasn't entirely far-fetched. Suddenly, she felt a light tap on her shoulder and turned to see Blake smiling at her. I thought you had gone ahead to school, she said, relieved to see him. Why would we rush to school? It's empty and dull there. It's much more enjoyable to travel together and chat, Blake replied, opening the door to an adjacent carriage which was surprisingly empty. How do you always find empty carriages? Hermione asked, astonished. She had been on the bus for a while and found all other carriages occupied. Just a bit of harmless magic, Blake said nonchalantly. After entering the carriage, Hermione realized it was the same one they had taken when they left Hogwarts three days ago. You hid an entire carriage? What if you were caught? 
but the school rules don't say anything about hiding carriages, Blake countered with a shrug. Besides, there are plenty of carriages. Missing one won't make a difference. Hermione wondered why the carriages, usually full, were now available. The Nurmengard Academy of Magic had taken responsibility for the incident. As Hermione settled in and stowed her school bag, she noticed a strawberry sundae in front of her. I passed a dessert shop this morning and thought of you, Blake said. Despite the chilly weather, the carriage was as warm as spring, thanks to the sunflowers Blake had placed on the table, making the ice cream an appealing treat. Hermione took small bites of her sundae, stealing glances at Blake. Um, have you visited anyone in the past few days? She probed, curious if Blake had been to Cassandra's house or perhaps somewhere else, like Ginny's. Not really. I've been occupied with some experiments, Blake replied, evading the question. Really? By the way, I saw Cassandra looking for you earlier. Let's not talk about that, Blake said, knowing he had to maintain his facade. He had no intention of revealing the truth to Hermione. Mr. Worley seems to have some misconceptions about me, he continued. So, I guess I'll have to keep my distance from Cassandra. Hermione looked at him skeptically. It was unlike Blake to talk about distancing himself from someone, especially Cassandra. She found it hard to believe. The compartment door clicked slightly, signaling the beginning of their journey and the unfolding of more mysteries. The door suddenly swung open. Blake, I finally found you! Cassandra exclaimed as she walked in, her complexion ghostly pale. Don't pay any attention to my father's absurd claims. I'm capable of making my own decisions, she declared her voice laced with determination. He has no right to meddle in my personal freedom, so, please, don't listen to him. Cassandra had stumbled upon this carriage by chance, overhearing Blake's intention to distance himself from her. The revelation had left her feeling deeply wronged. It seemed to her that Blake, without considering her feelings, had resolved to end their relationship. Blake's actions momentarily halted. He then realized that Hermione had left the door ajar upon entering. An open door meant that Blake's concealment charm would fail, which explained why Cassandra had been able to spot the hidden carriage as she passed by. Ahem, Cassandra, please take a seat, Blake suggested, regaining his composure. Cassandra bit her lip and complied, sitting across from Blake. Her feelings were a complex mix of indignation and guilt. After all, Blake had been nothing but kind to her, even going as far as to assist the Woolley family significantly, offering them newly developed plants and seeds without a second thought. Yet her father's response to Blake was anything but grateful. Empathizing with Blake, she could understand his reaction. Anyone would feel disheartened after being met with coldness and hostility despite their generous efforts. It seemed Blake wanted to sever ties with the Woolley family as a protective measure. Blake... This is all a big misunderstanding. My father didn't mean what you think, Cassandra tried to explain, though she herself was in the dark about the true nature of the situation. She pinned her hopes on her mother, believing she could sway her father's stubborn views. Little did she know, her father's animosity towards Blake was based on a deception that had caused his blood pressure to skyrocket. Really? Am I just overthinking things? Blake questioned, his tone softening. I, I sometimes struggle with self-esteem, so I might be overly sensitive, Cassandra admitted, her voice barely above a whisper, but I never wanted our relationship to end. Hermione, who had been quietly enjoying her strawberry sundae, couldn't help but smirk at the exchange. Low self-esteem? More like a feeling of inferiority, she thought, amused by Blake's dramatics. No, it's not you. It's actually what your father implied, Blake said, his expression turning grave once more. Cassandra frantically shook her head. No, no, it's just, he has a bit of a stern face. He didn't mean to single anyone out. Blake coughed violently, nearly choking. Facial paralysis? Really? He managed to say between coughs, incredulous at Cassandra's desperate attempt to justify her father's behavior. As the conversation unfolded, Blake's embarrassment became palpable. He was a master at manipulating situations to his advantage, and even Mr. Worley had been none the wiser. Cassandra, naive and unaware of the manipulation, believed her father genuinely disliked Blake, which only added to her guilt. Dad is too biased against Blake. I'll make sure he accepts him, Cassandra resolved, unaware that Blake was orchestrating the entire scenario. 
As night descended, the train reached its destination, marking the end of their unexpected holiday. Upon disembarking, Blake was greeted by Hagrid's enthusiastic embrace, which nearly crushed him. Ahem. Hagrid, a little gentler, please, Blake gasped. Oh, sorry, Blake, are you all right? Hagrid asked, concern evident in his voice. It's nothing serious, but why such a warm welcome all of a sudden? Blake inquired, puzzled by Hagrid's exuberant greeting. Hagrid knelt down, his eyes brimming with warmth and sincerity, resembling dark beetles in the dim light. With tears in his eyes, Hagrid exclaimed, I know that. I know everything. Dumbledore told me it was because of you that I finally saw things clearly. It's really, I don't even know what to say. Thank you for everything you've done for me. As he spoke, Hagrid took out his large handkerchief and wiped away his tears. Suddenly, a system prompt chimed in Blake's mind. Ding! Gratitude detected. Followed ding! Congratulations to the host for receiving a silver treasure chest. Another prompt quickly followed. Ding! A follower who is willing to follow the host has been detected. Will the host accept? Blake decided, not now. The system responded, ding! The inclusion of Rubus Hagrid ha has been put on hold for now. After addressing the system's notifications, Blake stood on tiptoe and gently patted the towering Hagrid on the shoulder. Okay, Hagrid, don't be like this, especially with people around. Blake chided him playfully. Come on, don't be so emotional. What I did was necessary. And hey, let's have tea together when I find some time. Blake mused on the situation. The Ministry of Magic was notorious for its sluggish efficiency, but even Dumbledore wasn't the quickest at times. However, Minister Fudge was still on good terms with Dumbledore and was more than willing to do him a favor, especially when it came to Hagrid. The evidence exonerating Hagrid was undeniable, and his rehabilitation was long overdue. Thus, Hagrid finally received the justice he deserved, leaving with immense gratitude. Cassandra and Hermione observed the exchange with astonishment. What did you do for that giant of a man? Cassandra asked, bewildered. He seems like he'd do anything for you now. Hermione, ever perceptive, eyed Blake with suspicion. Has what you've been busy with these past few days been about helping Hagrid? She inquired. Even though Hagrid was already your friend, he's never been as grateful as he is now. And to think, all this happened during just three days of vacation. I refuse to believe you spent those days just reading at home, Hermione declared, her skepticism clear. Blake faced the two girls, their curious gazes fixed on him. With a mischievous smile, he teased, Do you really want to know? He paused for effect before playfully adding, I won't tell you. The system promptly announced, Ding! Two angry emotions detected, followed by, Ding! Congratulations to the host for receiving two silver treasure chests. Chapter 275 Ah! Don't come over here! A tranquil Halloween had passed, and as time marched on, it reached the middle of November. It was Saturday, and spirits were high once again. This was because the new collegiate Quidditch season was kicking off this year. After a week filled with burdensome schoolwork, everyone was eager for a day of cheering and emotional release. Moreover, today marked the Derby match between the rival teams of Gryffindor and Slytherin, the first game since Slytherin had upgraded their equipment. Given Slytherin's notorious reputation, both Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were rooting for a Gryffindor victory. However, with Slytherin's new gear giving them a speed advantage, Gryffindor's chances of winning seemed slim. Slytherin's chasers, now faster, would likely score more easily. According to professional commentator Lee Jordan, the outcome might not hinge on the usual gameplay, but on whether Gryffindor could catch the Golden Snitch before Slytherin led by 150 points. Essentially, Gryffindor's victory rested on Harry Potter's shoulders. Beyond a 150-point lead, Gryffindor's chasers would struggle to outpace Slytherin. As 11 o'clock approached, everyone hurried to the Quidditch pitch, hoping to secure a good viewing spot. Hello, have you seen Blake? Hermione inquired, stopping a Hufflepuff girl. It was a strategic choice. Boys might not know Blake's whereabouts, but girls likely would. He's by the Gryffindor dressing room on the Quidditch pitch, the girl responded promptly. However, upon realizing Hermione was the one asking, her demeanor shifted. Granger, is it you? Aren't you Blake's friend? How do you not know where he is? She chided, then added with a hint of rivalry. If you're so negligent, I might just snatch him away from you. 
Hermione was left speechless, watching the girl walk away. She couldn't help but marvel at how many girls Blake had charmed. Given his impressive feats, it was no surprise he attracted so much attention. This realization led Hermione to question her own feelings for Blake, wondering if her lack of knowledge about his whereabouts indicated a deeper concern for things she couldn't have. Shaking off her thoughts, Hermione found Blake outside the Gryffindor team's locker room, casually sitting on the railing with sunglasses perched on his nose. Harry, donned in his red Gryffindor Quidditch jersey, stood before Blake, reaching out his hand. The surrounding crowd looked on in shock. Harry, you're not having a good day today, Blake observed, examining Harry's hand and then his face. What's wrong with me today? Harry asked, puzzled and concerned. Blake sighed dramatically. There are dark clouds overhead. Harry, growing anxious, pressed for details. What does that mean? It means your aura is dark today, your luck is poor, and you might face a bloody disaster, Blake explained ominously. Harry's fear intensified. What? What does a bloody disaster entail? Blake, feigning wisdom, responded, At best, you'll barely survive. If I were you, I wouldn't play today. Harry was visibly shaken. Is it really that serious? Pointing to a line on Harry's palm, Blake added, See, there's a break in your career line here. Do you know what that means? Harry, now thoroughly alarmed, could only stammer, What does it mean? Explain yourself. If you don't handle this properly, your entire career could be at stake. Whether it's as a Quidditch player or any other professional path, it could all come crashing down, Blake stated calmly. What? What does this mean? Harry's voice quivered with uncertainty. It's quite simple, really. If you don't manage this situation correctly, you could end up permanently injured, Blake explained, his tone unchanging. Harry felt as if he had been struck by lightning, his legs nearly giving way beneath him. Out of my way! Wood bellowed, storming out of the locker room to disperse the gathering crowd. His mind was in turmoil. On the eve of such an important game, here was the Quidditch captain from a rival, House, seemingly casting a spell over his star player to prevent him from playing. What could possibly be the motive? And judging by Harry's reaction, he seemed to have taken Blake's words to heart. It wasn't surprising, given Blake's reputation for insight and the fact that Harry's every doubt seemed transparent to Blake's skilled use of legilimency. Moreover, Harry was already under immense pressure, you know, especially after Wood's own declaration that the game must be won at all costs, even hinting at a fatal outcome for failure. As these thoughts swirled in his mind, Harry, still reeling from the conversation, allowed Wood to lead him back into the locker room, yet his gaze lingered on Blake. Blake, master, how can I overcome this? Harry pleaded. Harry, beware of Lockhart. If you see him, avoid him at all costs, even if it means crawling away. And if escape is impossible, use a stunning spell on him. Blake advised, just before he and Hermione were unceremoniously ejected from the vicinity. Hermione, landing in the stands with a thud, was utterly confused. I've only just arrived and know nothing of this. Why am I being thrown out too? I'm afraid it can't be helped. You're my friend, and others will naturally assume you're on my side, Blake explained, casually cleaning his sunglasses. Who says I'm on your side? Hermione retorted, her cheeks flushed with indignation. And what exactly are you up to? she demanded. Fortune-telling. I've developed a unique skill in reading faces and palms, Blake claimed, boasting shamelessly. In truth, his proficiency in legilimency rendered any need for psychological tricks obsolete. He could discern far more than mere surface thoughts, leaving those he read astounded by his accuracy. His recent activities were merely a guise to collect rewards under the pretense of fortune-telling. Fortune-telling? But you're a wizard. How can you possibly believe in such things? Hermione challenged, hurling her school bag at Blake in frustration. Are you simply trying to deceive Harry so he won't play, ensuring Gryffindor's defeat? She accused. I saw everything. If Wood hadn't intervened, Harry might have fallen for your trick and ended up seriously hurt. Hermione continued, her tone accusatory. It's not a deception, you'll see in time, Blake responded, touching his nose thoughtfully. And why would I want Gryffindor to lose? He mused aloud. Hmm. Perhaps you're trying to curry favor with someone, Hermione speculated, turning away. Someone? Blake echoed, feigning innocence. Ah, speaking of which, why haven't we seen Cassandra today? 
because this is the Gryffindor stand. Why would she, a member of our rival house, be here? Hermione retorted. And me? Blake pondered. You're from Hufflepuff, and Hufflepuff generally maintains good relations with Gryffindor, as well as with the other houses, Hermione explained, her tone softening slightly. So does that mean I could actually sneak into the Slytherin stands to watch the game? Maybe even with Cassandra? Blake mused, a mischievous glint in his eye. You, go ahead if you want. What does it matter to me? Why are you even asking me? Hermione snapped, turning her head away once more. Really? Can I actually go to Slytherin? Blake pressed, sensing her irritation. Fine, then I'll really go, he declared, feigning a dramatic exit. Get lost, Hermione exclaimed, her frustration evident. Ding, hostile emotion detected, a voice chimed in Blake's head. Ding, congratulations to the host for acquiring a silver treasure chest, the voice announced, marking another peculiar turn in their eventful day. The morning sun shone brightly over the Quidditch pitch, which was already bustling with excitement. The stands were filled to the brim, not just with Hogwarts students, but also with visitors from the nearby village of Hogsmeade. The open invitation to the public made the event even more thrilling, contributing to the packed stadium. The sharp whistle signaled the start of the game, and the players took to the bar sky with remarkable speed. Among the spectators, Blake, with a mischievous grin, borrowed Hermione's telescope without asking, eager to get a closer look at Harry. His suspicion was confirmed when he noticed a bludger, bewitched with an odd magic, aggressively targeting Harry. Blake surmised it was the work of house elf magic, though he humorously wondered why he bothered with the telescope when he possessed the Eye of Truth. Hermione, annoyed by Blake's antics, snatched the telescope back, scolding him for not having his own. Their playful banter was interrupted by the game's commentator, Lee Jordan, who exclaimed in shock as the bewitched bludger relentlessly pursued Harry. Despite Fred and George Weasley's efforts to protect their teammate, their distraction allowed Slytherin to score repeatedly, leading 60 to 0. The game was momentarily halted amid protests and calls for an investigation, which could potentially lead to Gryffindor forfeiting the match. However, Harry insisted on continuing, urging the Weasley twins to focus on the game rather than his safety. Blake, putting aside his quest for Hermione's telescope, used his eye of truth to locate the source of the enchanted bludger. Amidst the chaos, Harry, displaying remarkable skill and determination, caught the golden snitch, securing victory for Gryffindor. However, the triumph came at a cost, as Harry's arm was severely injured by the bludger. As Harry lay on the ground, cradling his broken arm and the golden snitch, he remembered Blake's cryptic warning about avoiding a certain disaster. The pain was excruciating, but Harry was more concerned about the possibility of permanent damage. He hoped Madame Pomfrey's expertise would be enough to heal him, puzzled by Blake's advice to steer clear of Professor Lockhart. Before Harry could delve deeper into his thoughts, he lost consciousness from the pain. Upon waking, he was greeted by the sight of Gilderoy Lockhart's dazzling smile, immediately recalling Blake's warning. Terrified at the prospect of Lockhart attempting to heal him, Harry protested vehemently, transforming into the Roaring Emperor in his desperation to avoid Lockhart's well-intentioned but potentially disastrous help. Stay with me for the treatment, Lockhart urged, his voice a mix of comfort and command. Lie down, Harry. It's just a simple spell. I've used it countless times. Despite Lockhart's reassurances, Harry was in agony and desperate to escape. I'm going to the hospital wing. I don't want you. Ah, why did I forget to bring my wand? In his pain, Harry began to awkwardly crawl away, echoing Blake's earlier warning that he should keep his distance from Lockhart at all costs. But it was already too late. Everyone, stand back, Lockhart announced, brandishing his wand with an air of misplaced confidence. Don't. 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 Harry's pleas were cut short, as a bizarre and intensely uncomfortable sensation surged from his shoulder down to his fingertips. It felt as though the very essence of his arm was being siphoned away. A collective gasp filled the room when they saw the result. Harry's arm had transformed into something resembling a thick, flesh-colored rubber glove. The bones in his arm had vanished entirely. Lockhart, visibly taken aback by the outcome, stared at Harry's limp arm. He prided himself on his spellcasting abilities, 
yet he had somehow managed to cast the bone-vanishing curse. The situation left him flustered and embarrassed. Ah, well, these things do happen, Lockhart attempted to savage the situation with a laugh. But the important thing is that the bones can be regrown. Remember this lesson, everyone. Now, Harry, let's make our way to the hospital wing. As Harry looked down at his boneless arm, Blake's warning echoed ominously in his mind. A mishandled situation like this could not only ruin his Quidditch career, but potentially leave him permanently disabled. The realization of his current predicament filled him with a deep sense of regret for not bringing his wand. Had he done so, he would ha the incapacitated Lockhart without a second thought to prevent this disaster. Glancing at his deformed arm, Harry thought despairingly of his future and the potential loss of his abilities. Ah! My ability to play Quidditch! The thought was too much for him, and overwhelmed by the shock and pain, Harry's eyes rolled back as he fainted, the word pill escaping his lips as he lost consciousness. Chapter 276 The Incident on the Quidditch Pitch On the Quidditch pitch, the hero of the day for Gryffindor, Harry Potter, was being rushed to the school hospital by his housemates. His arm hung limply, resembling a deflated rubber glove, causing onlookers to gasp in horror and instinctively distance themselves from the grinning Professor Lockhart. With a smile, he had managed to vanish all the bones in Harry's arm. Elsewhere, Draco Malfoy was receiving a stern lecture from his team captain, his face pale. The golden snitch had been mere centimeters from his grasp. If only he had reached out his hand, the glory would have been his. Now it was Harry who received the cheers, despite his injury. Damn it! Scarhead! Malfoy cursed under his breath. In a secluded corner of the pitch, a small figure was frantically banging his head against the wall. Dobby! Dobby didn't want anything bad to happen to Harry Potter, he muttered guiltily. Dobby wishes Harry Potter would leave Hogwarts and go home. Dobby would rather punish himself than see harm come to him. Suddenly, a carefree voice interrupted Dobby's self-flagellation. Hey, are you busy? Can you finish your work first? Startled, Dobby attempted to apparate away, only to realize his magic had failed him. Oh, I see this improved anti-apparition spell works on house elves after all, Blake remarked, stepping out from the shadows and observing Dobby's panicked expression. Dobby screamed and attempted to flee, but in the next instant, he felt himself being lifted by the back of his neck, his feet dangling helplessly in the air. Blake, possessing supernatural strength, held Dobby with ease, rendering the elf's struggles futile. Ding! Extreme panic detected! A voice announced, followed by, congratulations to the host for getting a golden treasure chest. Blake was pleasantly surprised, then examined Dobby with the eye of truth. Golden quality? It's no wonder Dobby has been seeking freedom for years. He truly is exceptional among house elves. Sir, please, let Dobby go. Poor Dobby was just passing through, Dobby pleaded, lying, as Blake was not his master. Passing by? I saw you tampering with that bludger. You wanted to kill Harry Potter, Blake accused. No, Dobby protested vehemently. Dobby doesn't want to kill Harry Potter. Dobby only wanted to save him, to make him leave Hogwarts. There's great danger here this year, the Chamber of Secrets. Realizing he had said too much, Dobby began to punish himself again. Bad Dobby. Bad Dobby. That's enough. Now, I'm taking you to see Professor Dumbledore. Since you're aware of the truth, it's time we uncovered the whole story, Blake said, his grin more genuine and charming than Lockhart's ever could be. Dobby's cries of despair were met with another notification of extreme panic, much to Blake's satisfaction. I feel comfortable now. Meanwhile, Dumbledore, having finished his work, stood up to make himself a cup of hot cocoa, a task he performed himself in the absence of house elves. Just then, he noticed a small circle of sparks in the sky. Ahem, Professor, are you free now? Is it convenient for me to come over? Blake's voice emanated from the circle of sparks. Come in, Dumbledore responded, setting his empty cup aside. The circle of sparks expanded, and Blake stepped through, holding a struggling Dobby in his grasp. Isn't this a house elf from Hogwarts? Dumbledore inquired peering down at Dobby. Obviously not. I know every house elf in Hogwarts, Dumbledore observed, his gaze shifting from Dobby to Blake, signaling the beginning of an important conversation. Dumbledore peered at Blake over his half-moon glasses. There are hundreds of house elves at Hogwarts. Actually, 135, Professor. 
Blake corrected firmly, his exceptional memory allowing him to recall the exact number of house elves. Dumbledore was momentarily at a loss for words. Okay, what's going on? In today's Quidditch match, he tampered with the bludger, resulting in Harry breaking his ablerza RM. Harry is injured? Dumbledore's frown deepened. Given Harry Potter's unique status, his injuries were always a cause for concern. Yes, he's currently in the school hospital. With a broken arm, he shouldn't need to be hospitalized, should he? Dumbledore eyed Blake with suspicion. In the wizarding world, a broken arm could be easily mended with a spell. Madame Pomfrey was adept at reattaching bones in mere seconds, eliminating the need for hospitalization. Well, Lockhart attempted to heal him, and then... Harry's arm was completely boneless, Blake explained, noticing Dumbledore's beard begin to tremble, this time due to the situation at hand. Dumbledore's gaze shifted to Dobby, who, under the scrutiny of the century's greatest wizard, had ceased his struggles. When Blake set him down, Dobby couldn't even stand properly and collapsed to the ground. I find it hard to believe a house elf would intentionally harm a wizard. Can you explain your actions? Dumbledore asked gently. Dobby, sitting on the ground and sobbing, replied, Dobby wanted to save Harry Potter's life. It's better for him to be sent home with serious injuries than to stay here. Dobby only wanted Harry Potter to be slightly injured and sent home. Something terrible is going to happen at Hogwarts soon if it hasn't already. Dobby can't let Harry Potter stay here because history is about to repeat itself. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened again. Dobby's voice trailed off, his fear palpable. Suddenly his eyes locked onto a cup on Dumbledore's table. With a cry, he lunged for it, intending to hit himself on the head. However, Blake, anticipating this, lifted him up again. No. Let Dobby go. Dobby must punish himself. Dobby wailed. You need to calm down first, Dumbledore said softly, tapping Dobby's forehead lightly. Dobby's struggles ceased and his large, ping-pong ball-sized eyes began to close. Moments later, he was asleep. Dumbledore turned to Blake. What do you think? Blake shrugged. Clearly, we've kept the news about the Chamber of Secrets too well hidden. This poor house elf didn't know we've already addressed the issue, so he thought Harry was still in danger. His intentions were good, but his methods were rather extreme. If he continued trying to save Harry in this manner, Harry might have been sent away prematurely. Dumbledore nodded in agreement. Yes, and since we've kept the Chamber of Secrets under wraps, it would be nearly impossible for outsiders to know about it unless the information was leaked. Blake continued. It's evident that this house elf, Dobby, knew about the Chamber of Secrets before any of us at Hogwarts did. Remember when Harry started school and the passage was blocked? He had to fly to school in Mr. Weasley's car. I suspect Dobby was behind that as well, given that no one else had a motive. So, if he knew about this before us, it confirms one thing. Whoever Dobby works for is behind the Chamber of Secrets incident, Blake concluded. Dumbledore clapped his hands softly, impressed. Astute observation, Blake. I had the same thought. In other words, the diary found in Ginny's textbook likely came from Dobby's master. Dobby's personal admiration for Harry allowed him to overcome his fear of his master temporarily, trying every means to keep Harry out of harm's way. This explains why he resorted to self-punishment after divulging crucial information. Chapter Revision The Master Behind the Curtain The crux of the matter now lay in a single question. Who was Dobby's master? The room was thick with anticipation as Blake spoke up, his voice cutting through the silence. There's no need to speculate. It's Lucius Malfoy. Dumbledore, ever the picture of calm, raised an eyebrow and inquired with a gentle smile. And why do you believe that? Blake leaned forward, his argument ready. Ginny mentioned that Mr. Weasley and Lucius Malfoy had a confrontation at Flourish and Blots. During the scuffle, Ginny's books were scattered everywhere. If someone wanted to discreetly slip an ordinary-looking diary among Ginny's textbooks, that chaos provided the perfect opportunity. Furthermore, house elves like Dobby are typically found in the service of pure-blood families, such as the Malfoys. Most compelling, however, is the fact that Lucius Malfoy would have access to Tom Riddle's belongings. It's well known that he once had Tom's trust. Dumbledore nodded, his expression grave. Indeed, Lucius went to great lengths to distance himself from past crimes. So, can we take action against him? 
Blake asked, hope flickering in his eyes. Dumbledore sighed, the weight of the situation heavy on his shoulders. Unfortunately, we lack direct evidence of Malfoy's involvement. A house elf cannot be expected to testify against his master. Blake's frustration was palpable. So we're aware that he nearly turned Hogwarts into a bloodbath, yet our hands are tied? This is absurd. In the wizarding world, shouldn't a simple dose of Veritaserum solve such disputes? He shook his head in disbelief. Clearly, the Ministry lacks the courage to confront Lucius Malfoy with such measures. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled with a hint of mischief. While we may not be able to convict him, there are ways to ensure he faces consequences. Blake's interest was piqued, recognizing the mischievous glint in Dumbledore's gaze. Arthur Weasley frequently participates in raids to confiscate cursed items, doesn't he? With just a tip-off, he could lead a team to Malfoy's doorstep. Of course, we wouldn't expect to find blatantly cursed muggle artifacts, but I'm sure there are other items Lucius would prefer remain hidden. Blake's applause filled the room. Keeping the Chamber of Secrets incident under wraps meant Arthur Weasley had yet to express his full outrage. This plan would not only allow Mr. Brun Weasley to channel his anger, but also make Lucius Malfoy pay a price for his deeds. It was an elegant solution. Dumbledore then turned his attention to Dobby, his gaze softening. Let him return home, but inform him that the chamber's mystery has been resolved. It's crucial to keep this matter confidential, but if we don't reassure Dobby, he might continue his misguided attempts to save Harry. Blake nodded in agreement. Understood, I'll ensure Dobby receives the message. With that, Blake stepped through a dimensional door that had opened in the office, vanishing from sight. Dumbledore, left alone, reached for his cup, expecting to find it empty. To his surprise, it now contained steaming hot chocolate. A smile crept across his face as he picked up the cup. Ah, that boy! Always so thoughtful, Dumbledore chuckled, savoring the warmth of the unexpected gift. Chapter 277 Blake, Lockhart? I'm afraid I might accidentally beat him to death. When Dobby awoke, the first thing he saw was the expansive blue sky above him, and he found himself lying on a patch of grass. Shaking his head to clear it, he sat up. Not far from him, a large blue bird observed him curiously, tilting its head. Surveying his surroundings, Dobby realized he was in the middle of a vast grassland under a clear blue sky. However, an out-of-place door stood alone nearby, its presence stark against the natural landscape. Suddenly, the door creaked open, and a young wizard stepped through. Ah, it's, it's you! Dobby trembled at the sight of Blake, finding this young wizard far more intimidating than even Professor Dumbledore. Awake, are you? Blake inquired. Dobby? Is Dobby going to die? Dobby asked, shrinking back in fear. Die? No. Why would we kill you? Blake replied, conjuring two extra stools and placing one on the grass. Please, take a seat, Dobby. I believe we can have a conversation. Oh, Dobby, please sit down. Dobby, no longer as frightened, hesitantly climbed onto the stool. In his worldview, anyone who showed such courtesy to a house elf couldn't be evil. Would you like some tea? Blake offered. Uh, Dobby? Dobby, no. Before Dobby could finish his refusal, he found himself holding a cup of steaming black tea. Dobby, Dobby, oh wow! Overwhelmed, Dobby burst into tears, his hands shaking so much that he nearly dropped the cup. Why are you crying? How can we discuss anything like this? Blake said, somewhat exasperated. He had secretly probed Dobby's soul while the elf was unconscious, not to invade his memories but to understand whether house elves were enslaved through magic or indoctrination. This exploration revealed that their servitude was due to deep-seated brainwashing without any magical enforcement. This realization explained why there were outliers like Dobby who began to question their ingrained beliefs. After calming down, Blake shared, I wanted to inform you that we're aware of the Chamber of Secrets issue and have resolved it. It wasn't publicized for certain reasons. We took advantage of the Halloween break to eliminate the monster within the chamber. The basilisk is dead, so there's no need for you to protect Harry Potter any longer. His life is no longer in danger. Dobby, shocked at first, soon cried tears of joy. Harry Potter can stay at Hogwarts without facing danger. That's wonderful. Thank you, great sir. It must have been you and Professor Dumbledore who uncovered and addressed the threat, right? After some time, Blake managed to soothe Dobby's emotions. 
Now that you're informed, you can return. Can Dobby go back? Dobby's response lacked enthusiasm. What don't you wish to return to your master? Blake inquired. Dobby! Dobby! Ah! Bad Dobby! Bad Dobby! Dobby began to chastise himself, but Blake quickly intervened to prevent him from self-harm. You are a unique elf, Dobby, Blake said, handing him a small bottle. If one day you decide to pursue the desires of your heart, drink this. But be aware, if you do, there's a 50% chance. You will either die or you will get what you desire, he said, his voice carrying a weight that made the room seem colder. The choice is yours, based on your own conscience. Dobby looked at Blake, his eyes wide with surprise. Blake returned the gaze calmly, his blue eyes piercing, as if he could see right into Dobby's soul. After a moment of silence, Dobby whispered, Before I leave, may I visit Harry Potter alone? The next morning, Harry left the school hospital. His arm bones were grown. They were still stiff, but infinitely better than the unsettling floppiness he'd endured, which had made him fear for the loss of his arm. He mentally thanked Madame Pomfrey and the Bone Spirit for their help. As for Lockhart, Harry now harbored a strong desire to knock his teeth out. The house elf named Dobby had confessed to being behind the troubles, initially angering Harry. However, he realized De Dobby's intentions were good, unlike Lockhart, who sought fame without regard for his competence. With these thoughts, Harry headed to the dining hall for breakfast. Scarhead, you got lucky this time, Malfoy sneered from a distance. It's not luck, it's someone's stupidity, Harry retorted, raising his still stiff arm to his ear, mocking Malfoy. Oh, if I recall, the golden snitch was in your possession at that time? Malfoy's face drained of color at Harry's pointed reminder of his recent failures. Scarhead, I challenge you to a duel, Malfoy declared, his emotions boiling over. A duel? Without your cronies to back you up? Harry quipped, ready to confront him. Their standoff was interrupted by a familiar, unwelcome voice. Did someone say duel? There's no one better at dueling than me, Lockhart announced, inserting himself into the situation. Harry didn't need to see him to recognize the voice. With Lockhart's presence, the duel was effectively quashed, given his status as a professor. Oh, Harry, how's your arm? No need to thank me. I merely said it so you could recover swiftly. Lockhart boasted, oblivious to Harry's irritation. Harry nearly lost his temper, wanting nothing more than to escape Lockhart's self-praise. As he turned to leave, Lockhart's voice followed him, offering dueling lessons. Harry paused, an idea forming. Perhaps Lockhart could be put in his place. Professor Lockhart, since you're so adept at dueling, perhaps you should lead the dueling club, Harry suggested, knowing full well the previous year's instructor had been less than stellar. Lockhart's face lit up at the suggestion. Ah! Since you insist, I'll join the dueling club as its instructor, he declared, thrilled at the opportunity to showcase his supposed skills. Harry couldn't help but smirk at the thought of Lockhart attempting to impress Blake, the dueling club's president. The encounter between the two promised to be interesting. Malfoy, still fuming, warned Harry of his perceived discomfort. Harry merely laughed, unbothered by Malfoy's glare already anticipating the drama that would unfold with Lockhart's involvement in the dueling club. If you're not convinced, then meet me at the 910 Duel Club and I'll show you how to behave properly. Who's scared of who? It was Friday night, the designated day for the Duel Club's activities. Typically, Blake, the club's president, along with the vice president, Pinello, would demonstrate various dueling spells before allowing the members to practice on their own. However, today was different. All members of the Duel Club had received a notification to gather in the activity room at 6 o'clock that evening for a special session with a new instructor. The news had sparked excitement among the members, as the presence of an instructor promised to make the evening's class far more engaging. Blake, however, was not sharing in the general enthusiasm. She was in a foul mood. Pinello, didn't we agree to invite Professor Flitwick to be our advisor? she asked. After all, he was a dueling champion in his youth. There's no one more qualified. Pinello sighed as she placed a stack of forms back on the table. I know, but Professor Flitwick is currently unavailable. He's wrapping up some work and plans to return as a tutor later. And then, out of nowhere, Professor Lockhart offered to step in. Blake frowned. Why should he get to be the advisor just because he wants to? 
Does Professor Dumbledore know about this? Of course he does. Professor Dumbledore agreed to it, Pinello replied. Blake scratched his head in frustration. He couldn't help but think that Dumbledore was losing his touch. It seemed inconceivable to Blake that Dumbledore, despite his age, would be unaware of Lockhart's dubious reputation. Yet, not only had Dumbledore appointed Lockhart as the defense against the dark arts professor, but he had also approved him as the dual club's instructor. Blake couldn't fathom Dumbledore's intentions. Okay, Blake, let's not dwell on this for now. You should start getting ready, Pinello suggested. Ready for what? Blake asked, puzzled. As the president of the duel club, you're expected to have a demonstration duel with the instructor during tonight's session, Pinello explained. Upon hearing this, Blake's expression turned blank. Well then, I do need to prepare. Otherwise, I might accidentally defeat him too severely. The conversation highlighted the tension and skepticism surrounding the new instructor's appointment, setting the stage for an intriguing duel club session. Chapter 278, Lockhart, thanks to Harry's kind invitation. Harry, it's over. The afternoon stretched ahead and Blake, foregoing any breaks or meals, donned his alchemy glasses and delved into his work. It wasn't until 5.40 p.m., with the evening drawing near, that he finally paused. Pinello, knowing his tendency to skip meals when engrossed in his projects, brought him several meat pies and a bottle of pumpkin juice. Blake, setting aside the rough-looking rings he had been working on, sighed. Given the time constraints, this is the best I could manage. Wash your hands first, Pinello insisted, eyeing the black stains marring Blake's hands from his recent refining work. With a resigned nod, Blake conjured a basin of water with a spell and washed his hands clean. What have you been working on all afternoon? Pinello inquired, her curiosity piqued by the rings on Blake's table. Just some gadgets to control magic, Blake replied nonchalantly, taking a hearty bite of his pie. You have no idea how challenging it is for me every time we train together. He explained how, with age, his already abnormal magical power continued to grow, making it increasingly difficult to control. This was a natural progression, akin to how physical strength increases with age, but for someone with Blake's extraordinary capabilities, the escalation was alarmingly significant. Fearing the potential harm he could cause during duels, especially with a session scheduled with Lockhart that evening, Blake had crafted several magic control rings. These devices could suppress his magic, allowing him to unleash his full power when necessary and keep it in check otherwise. It was a temporary solution, akin to fixing a leaky pipe, but it promised to alleviate some of Blake's concerns. I see. So training with me has been difficult for you, Pinello remarked, her expression unreadable. Blake's heart raced. Senior, that's not what I meant. I know, you don't need to explain, Pinello replied calmly, though Blake couldn't help but feel a chill. I'm kidding, she added with a smirk, lightening the mood. But really, it must be tough training with me, right? Curious about the ring's efficacy, Pinello slipped one onto her finger. Is this really as powerful as you say? It can suppress your magic. Try it and see, Blake encouraged. Pinello nodded, aimed her wand at a chair, and attempted a levitation spell, but to her astonishment, the chair remained unmoved. After several more unsuccessful attempts with spells she was proficient in, she removed the ring, and her magic flowed smoothly once again. Blake, it feels terrible to be powerless, Pinello admitted, shaken by the experience. Blake reassured her with a smile. Senior, it's okay. Even if you were to become powerless, I could still help you. With a playful roll of her eyes, Pinello conceded. Just bragging. Okay, it's time for me to get ready. Professor Lockhart will be arriving soon. As they prepared for the evening's training session, the atmosphere was a mix of anticipation and trepidation, with Blake's new invention promising to add an unexpected element to the proceedings. Lockhart's mention caused Blake's expression to sour. Why should you care about him? Just come if you want to. It's not like you don't know the way. Please, show some maturity. Regardless of your feelings towards me, I am still a professor. How can you come unprepared? Blake slouched further into his chair, his frustration evident. Senior sister, are you serious right now? You're asking a twelve-year-old to act mature. You, you always make people forget you're just a child, Pinello retorted, her curiosity shifting. By the way, have you tried on those rings of yours? 
she was intrigued by a ring that could potentially turn a wizard into a squib. After Blake puts it on, she wondered, how could he still perform magic? Blake calmly picked up a ring and slid it onto his finger. He paused, feeling its effects carefully. Under Pinello's astonished gaze, he proceeded to put on a secco, end ring, then a third, until he had five rings adorning his hand. Only then did he nod in satisfaction. It's fine, he declared. You, can you still perform magic now? Pinello asked, shock evident in her voice. One ring was enough to render her powerless, yet Blake had managed to wear five. Blake took out his wand, examining it briefly, before putting it away. After rummaging in his pocket, he found an old, second-hand wand he had bought from a shop in Diagon Alley for experimental purposes. In the past, using this wand was practically a death wish, as it was prone to exploding. But now, Blake pointed the wand at the chair Pinello had previously enchanted with a levitation spell. Without uttering a single incantation, the chair began to levitate slowly. Pinello watched in disbelief. You, you can still use magic with five rings on? And cast a spell silently? Blake nodded. It's quite manageable, but casting spells without a wand might prove more challenging. Pinello was momentarily lost for words, but she eventually grasped the gravity of Blake's statement. It wasn't just challenging for him to cast spells without a wand or incantations. It was a testament to his suppressed magical power still being formidable enough to perform magic. Indeed, some people were just naturally infuriating. Ding! Shock detected! Ding! Congratulations to the host for receiving a silver treasure chest. Lockhart's arrival was swift, almost as if delaying any longer would diminish his chance to stand out in the duel club. Blake noticed the mixed reactions among the students at the announcement of their advisor. Some appeared disheartened, while others were visibly excited. It was clear that Lockhart's reputation had sown confusion among many. However, Blake found something particularly interesting. Harry Potter, of all people, seemed as thrilled as the girl next to him at the sight of Lockhart. Considering Harry's recent unpleasant encounter with Lockhart, this excitement was puzzling. Even Ron, Harry's close friend, shared Blake's confusion, looking at Harry as if he had witnessed something as improbable as Harry and Snape falling in love. A truly bizarre thought. Blake, intrigued, stroked his chin. Now this is getting interesting. By noon, a large dual stage had been erected in the center of the classroom, covered with a soft blue carpet to minimize the risk of injury. Lockhart, clad in a purple-red robe that made him stand out, stepped onto the stage. Come closer, everyone. Can you all see me? Can you hear me? His voice captured the attention of the students, who had been practicing independently, drawing them towards the dual platform. That's right. At the request of both teachers and students, I've graciously agreed to serve as the guidance professor for this modest dual club, Lockhart announced, his tone dripping with false modesty. I was hesitant at first, but your enthusiastic pleas were simply too compelling to ignore. He added, especially highlighting the supposed clamor from the school's most prominent figures. Harry Potter. The name echoed with a mixture of awe and excitement, hinting at the reverence even the Minister of Magic held for him. Harry, still basking in the thrill of the moment, suddenly froze as his own name pierced through the chatter. His heart skipped a beat, and he turned, his face draining of color, to see Blake casting a mischievous glance his way. Harry managed a strained, awkward smile in response. Harry, you seemed off just now, Ron exclaimed, concern lacing his voice. Did that bludger knock some sense out of you the other day? You actually asked Lockhart to be your advisor? Harry's complexion turned even paler, if possible. Sorry, Ron, I might not live to see another sunrise, he joked weakly, though the humor didn't quite reach his eyes. Blake has a reputation for holding grudges. Indeed, Harry had hoped Blake would teach Lockhart a lesson, but he hadn't anticipated Lockhart would foolishly reveal Harry's involvement. Reflecting on it, Harry realized he show Eld have expected as much from Lockhart, a man notorious for basking in even the slightest bit of fame. It was Harry, after all, who had suggested Lockhart for the role, mistakenly believing it would remain a private arrangement. Lockhart's penchant for self-promotion should have been obvious. As Harry watched from the audience, his disappointment was palpable. Meanwhile, Lockhart, ever the showman, was thriving in the spotlight on stage. 
Since I've agreed to be the instructor, I'll ensure everyone is thoroughly trained, Lockhart announced with unwarranted confidence. Should the need arise to defend yourselves, you'll be equipped with the very techniques I've employed countless times for my own protection. And for those eager for more in-depth knowledge, my published works are always available. Lockhart's gaze then found Blake in the crowd. Now, allow me to introduce my assistant, Blake Green, a prodigiously talented young wizard whose accomplishments are already rivaling my own at his age. As the inaugural president of the Duel Club, he'll assist me with a demonstration today. But fear not, Lockhart added with a flourish, I assure you, your president will be returned to you unharmed. Ron leaned over to Harry, whispering, He's quite full of himself, isn't he? I have a feeling he's the one who won't be walking away from this unscathed. Yeah, Harry replied, his voice tinged with resignation. He shared Ron's sentiment, wishing Lockhart had simply kept his mouth shut. Blake, having no choice but to play along, forced a smile and made his way to the stage, slipping a ring onto his finger as he walked. Next to Lockhart's flamboyant demeanor, Blake's appearance was markedly understated, clad in his Hufflepuff uniform. Yet, as he faced Lockhart with a smile, there was an unmistakable air of confidence about him. Harry felt a chill run down his spine. If Blake's smile was anything to go by, he knew he was in for a rough time. Ron, take care of Hedwig for me, he muttered, half joking yet half serious, as he braced himself for what was to come. Chapter 279 Lockhart was ironclad. On the stage, Blake shook his hand, feeling his own strength surge. He then raised his head and addressed Professor Lockhart. In light of your remarkable adventures, you're presumed to be a very powerful wizard, so I'm going to give it my all. Do you have any objections? Hearing Blake refer to him as a powerful wizard filled Lockhart with a sudden burst of happiness. Of course I have no objection, he exclaimed. In fact, for a young wizard like you, even if you go all out, there's no way you can harm me at all. Lockhart's words were brimming with confidence, leaving Blake puzzled about the source of his self-assurance, given what he had seen of Lockhart's capabilities. But since Lockhart was so agreeable, Blake thought, okay, then I'll do my best. Choosing to use a second-hand wand, Blake was cautious. His own wand was too powerful, and he feared accidentally causing serious harm to Lockhart, which would spoil the fun. Today, Lockhart was present, and Blake intended to play this slowly, especially for those who had suffered permanent harm from Lockhart's forgetfulness spells. Under the watchful eyes of the audience, Blake and Lockhart faced each other and bowed, adhering to the dueling etiquette. Lockhart's wand performed some impressive tricks, and then they both held their wands to their chests, mimicking swords. As you can see, we are adopting a dueling stance, Blake announced. On the count of three, we will cast our first spells. Of course, we will not aim to take each other's lives. Three, two, one, go. Both wizards raised their wands simultaneously. Blake shouted, Silencio. A blinding white light shot from Blake's wand, striking Lockhart squarely in the chest and causing him to stagger. Touching his chest in astonishment, Lockhart thought, it doesn't hurt. However, he quickly realized something was amiss. He found himself unable to open his mouth at all. His tongue was stuck to his upper teeth, and his lips were sealed shut. Lockhart looked at Blake in surprise, wondering about his intention. Was it to prevent him from reciting spells and fighting back? But Blake had other plans. With an exaggerated shout, he cast Expelliarmus. A dazzling red light burst forth, hitting Lockhart again. Lockhart felt his grip loosen, but to his astonishment, his hand was open. Yet his wand remained firmly attached. What happened? Lockhart was bewildered. He hadn't done anything to cause this. He wanted to ask questions, but his sealed mouth made it impossible. Blake then cast another spell, and a dazzling white light hit Lockhart's chest once more, feeling like a whip. Lockhart wanted to scream, but his mouth wouldn't open, and his throat felt blocked, preventing even a whimper. Attempting to dodge, he found his body immobilized, caught under Blake's spell. Blake continued his assault, casting spell after spell, marking Lockhart's body with white flashes. Despite this, despite this, Lockhart remained silent and motionless. The audience was in awe. It's incredible. Blake is amazing. No, I mean Lockhart. What? Look, he didn't dodge or flinch. He just took Blake's spells without making a sound or moving. Is it true? 
Did we misjudge him? Is he really a powerful wizard? Yeah. Look, Blake's spells can't hurt him at all. The audience was abuzz with speculation, but on stage, Lockhart was nearing his limit. Was it because Lockhart found himself unable to speak, his body frozen in place as if bound by an invisible force? His wand, too, seemed to have become an extension of his hand, immovable and unyielding. The options that might have crossed anyone's mind in such a situation, screaming for help, attempting to dodge the incoming spells, or even throwing the wand away in surrender, were all beyond his reach. Blake's spell, though not strong enough to render him unconscious, inflicted a pain that was almost unbearable. It was as though he was being whipped, yet the spell was peculiar. It left no physical marks on his clothes or skin. It was as if the whip lashed at his soul directly. Professor Lockhart, that's amazing, Blake exclaimed, feigning admiration. It's just a protective spell that I can't break. Ah, I understand now, Professor. You remained motionless to test whether I could break your protective spell, Blake concluded, as if having an epiphany. The audience, misled by Blake's words, erupted into discussions. Some praised Lockhart's supposed resilience, while others reconsidered their previous underestimation of his abilities. However, a few spectators sensed that something was amiss, choosing to observe in silence rather than join the chatter. Lockhart, on the brink of tears, was in turmoil. He had no protective spells in place. The notion that he was enduring the onslaught to test Blake's strength was absurd. The guilt and injustice of the situation weighed heavily on him, yet he felt powerless to defend his reputation. Just as Lockhart thought the ordeal was over, Having been hit by Blake's banishing spell and sent flying, he experienced a momentary relief. However, this was short-lived. His robe tightened around him, and he was pulled back to the stage by Blake's use of the flying curse. Internally, Lockhart despaired, facing yet another round of merciless attacks. Then, amidst the chaos, a spell from Blake caused a cloud of smoke to envelop the stage. Through the haze, Blake's voice reached Lockhart, taunting him with names of individuals he had wronged in the past. Lockhart's heart sank as Blake insinuated that among those he had harmed were friends of Professor Dumbledore. The implication that Dumbledore had hired him as a defense against the dark arts professor to expose his fraudulent past was terrifying. Lockhart realized that maintaining his facade of a powerful wizard would be impossible under such scrutiny. What Lockhart didn't know was that Blake's accusations were entirely fabricated. If Dumbledore was aware of the victims, these words were sufficient to instill fear in Lockhart. For the time being, Professor Dumbledore harbors suspicions towards you, Blake revealed, his tone even but laden with implications. He brought you on board primarily to keep an eye on you, to scrutinize your every move. However, I possess exactly what he's been seeking. Blake continued, his gaze piercing. So, to preserve your facade, I presume you understand the necessary steps you must take next, correct? Lockhart's eyes darted frantically, a clear attempt to convey his comprehension. Having been cornered, Lockhart found himself without the courage to defy Blake. As the smoke that had enveloped the room began to clear, Lockhart discovered his mobility returning, his mouth no longer sealed shut. Casting a terrified glance at Blake, he stammered, Ahem! Aha! Your leadership is indeed formidable. He added hastily, I believe. There's no need for a supervising professor in your case. With those words, Lockhart, still trembling, hurried out of the club room under Blake's significant look. The room fell into a stunned silence. It was evident to all present that something profound had transpired. Reflecting on the encounter, it became clear that Blake had dominated the conversation while Lockhart had remained silent throughout. Indeed, if Lockhart had truly been in control, he would have stood his ground. Yet, the absence of any response from him spoke volumes. Typically, a supervisor offers guidance, especially someone as notoriously verbose as Lockhart. His sudden silence could only mean one thing. He had been rendered speechless at that moment. After piecing together the clues, the conclusion was unmistakable. Blake had immobilized Lockhart and then intimidated him into submission, leaving Lockhart too frightened to utter a single word. Harry, who had secretly relished the thought of Lockhart being put in his place, was jolted back to reality by a sudden touch on his shoulder. 
I was informed by Professor Lockhart that he accepted the advisory role at your behest. Harry turned to find Blake standing behind him, a smile playing on his lips. Face, D with Blake's unsettling calm, Harry's thoughts raced to the point of drafting a mental suicide note. Chapter 280, Blake's True Intentions and the Armenian Old Wizard Blake had no intention of harming Harry. His focus was on dealing with Lockhart, and Harry's actions merely expedited the process. With the mystery of the Chamber of Secrets resolved and the basilisk neutralized, the original fate that awaited Lockhart, being struck by his own obliviate spell due to Ron's malfunctioning wand, was averted. However, Blake was determined not to let Lockhart escape the consequences of his actions. Understanding the severe repercussions of a potent Obliviate spell, which could cause irreversible damage as it did to Lockhart in the original story, Blake was aware that Lockhart's ambition to maintain his facade likely led to more than just memory erasure for his victims. Eliminating Lockhart would have been simple for Blake, but murder was not an option within the walls of Hogwarts. More importantly, Blake believed that Lockhart should endure the repercussions of his deceit. Since Lockhart prized his reputation above all, Blake decided that this was precisely where his punishment should begin. Following Lockhart's hasty retreat from the dueling club meeting, the session concluded prematurely. The students, now in small groups, practiced on their own but couldn't help discussing the evening's events. The sight of a professor being outmatched by a student and fleeing without a word was certainly a topic of intrigue. As Blake exited the classroom, his system space was enriched with more than ten bronze treasure chests. Cassandra and others were eager to inquire about the incident, having sensed something amiss, but Blake had vanished by the time they decided to approach him. Lockhart, meanwhile, rushed back to his office and frantically began packing his belongings. The portraits of him that adorned the walls recoiled in fear, sensing the urgency of his actions. Lockhart's mind was consumed by a single thought, escape. Aware of his own reprehensible deeds, he believed fleeing was his only option, especially if Blake had evidence of his misconduct. Imagining a scenario where he could manipulate his departure to appear as a victim of jealousy and slander at Hogwarts, Lockhart packed with renewed vigor. However, Lockhart's plan was flawed. The exposure of his actions would inevitably lead to an investigation into the victims of his Obliviate spells. Despite his belief that he could erase any trace of his spells from his wand, the potential damage to his reputation was undeniable. The realization that evidence of his use of the Obliviate spell could be uncovered filled him with panic and frustration. Lockhart was caught in a web of his own deceit, realizing too late that his actions could have lasting consequences not just for his victims, but for his cherished reputation as well. No, I can't allow my resume and reputation to be tarnished, not even slightly. There must be a way out. Lockhart realized he had stopped packing. He sat on his suitcase, frantically running his fingers through his neat, shiny blonde hair. How did this happen? I was so careful, ensuring no one was around. How did Blake Green uncover these things? He paused, his mind racing. Wait! A realization struck him. Blake's intention was to blackmail him, not to expose him directly to Dumbledore. This meant there was still a chance to salvage the situation. Blake must want something from him, a favor or a service, perhaps. Lockhart's spirits lifted at this thought. To him, being blackmailed seemed a small price to pay to protect his reputation. It was a peculiar way of thinking, perhaps a desperate attempt to avoid facing the imminent collapse of his carefully constructed facade. What does Blake want from me? After much deliberation, Lockhart concluded that Blake, like him, sought fame and recognition. Despite knowing very little, Lockhart was adept at managing his public image. If that's the case? With renewed purpose, Lockhart ceased his packing and began to write a letter. You attacked Professor Lockhart? Dumbledore inquired, his gaze fixed o, and the books on his desk, making it hard for Blake to read his expression. Yes, Blake admitted, expecting a reprimand. I assumed you'd offer some justification. After all, attacking a professor is a serious matter. Dumbledore finally looked up, a slight smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I don't see it as attacking a professor. Before the duel, he urged me to use my full strength. He didn't surrender or disarm, so I assumed the duel was ongoing. 
Dumbledore's smile became more apparent. I see. And why have you come to me? Professor Lockhart hasn't lodged any complaints. I'm here to request a leave of absence for a long journey, Blake explained. Dumbledore removed his glasses, considering Blake with a quiet intensity before replacing them. Very well, avoid Nurmengard, but otherwise, you have my blessing. Just inform me upon your return. Thank you, Professor, Blake said, turning to leave. Dumbledore's voice stopped him. You must be curious why I brought Lockhart back as a professor. I was, initially, Blake admitted, turning back. But I've come to understand your reasoning. Oh, and what might that be? Dumbledore asked, genuinely intrigued. Two reasons, Blake began. First, his deceitful nature would be exposed in a school environment. Second, you wanted to teach us a lesson on the dangers of deceit and the importance of integrity. By experiencing our disdain for Lockhart, we're less likely to emulate him. Dumbledore sighed, a mixture of admiration and surprise in his voice. Your insight exceeds my expectations. I thought you'd question my decision to hire him, but it seems I underestimated you. Take Nagini with you on your journey. She'll be of assistance. And if you could, greet Rep. Carlos of Armenia for me. Just remember, avoid Nurmengard at all costs. As Blake left Dumbledore's office, he was struck by a realization. His offhand comments to Lockhart had inadvertently revealed a deeper truth. Dumbledore was indeed aware of Lockhart's past misdeeds and had hired him as a professor not just to expose him, but to impart a valuable lesson on integrity and the consequences of deceit. Dumbledore had always been a figure shrouded in mystery, and Blake couldn't help but admire the man's foresight. He had correctly surmised Blake's intention to seek out those wizards who had suffered at the hands of others. Yet Dumbledore was unaware of Blake's deeper motive. The journey to confront Lockhart was merely a piece of a larger puzzle. It was a cold, dark night in a small, dilapidated village in Armenia. The remnants of once sturdy walls now lay in ruins, a testament to the village's long-forgotten defeat. In one of the crumbling houses, a frail old man sought refuge. The biting cold wind found its way through the gaps, chilling him to the bone. Hunger gnawed at him as he huddled for warmth, his strength waning. Suddenly, the oppressive chill ceased, and the room inexplicably warmed. Light filled the space, banishing the shadows. The old man, bewildered, lifted his head. Two figures in black cloaks had appeared, one of them cradling a pot of sunflowers that radiated warmth and light. The sight of the flowers left the old man in awe. Never in his life had he witnessed such beauty. He murmured something in Armenian, a question born of his confusion and fear. He's asking if we are messengers sent by the god of death, Nagini translated, her knowledge of the language coming as a surprise to Blake. Tell him we are not death's heralds, Blake instructed. We are here to offer him a chance at rebirth. Nagini relayed the message, and the old man's eyes widened in disbelief. For the first time, he noticed that one of the cloaked figures was a woman, and the other a mere child. The sight of a wand in the child's hand was the last thing he remembered before darkness claimed him. When he awoke, the squalor that had defined his existence had vanished. The house was now as warm as spring, a stark contrast to the ruin it had been. Lockhart's oblivion curse erased all his memories. Blah, he explained. He forgot his name, his past, and his magic. He became nothing more than a helpless old man. Nagini looked at the old wizard, now resting peacefully. Is he the one Lockhart wrote about in Wandering with Werewolves? Blake nodded, then addressed the question of restoring the man's memory. It's unnecessary. His memories have been reclaimed by me. He elaborated on the nature of memory and the soul, explaining how, despite the physical erasure of memories, a backup exists deep within the soul. This was why some, like Hermione with her parents, could recover from the effects of a memory charm. Lockhart's curse was potent, but not beyond repair for someone versed in the arts of necromancy. As the old wizard awoke, confusion gave way to realization. Speaking in halting English, he expressed his gratitude to Blake for restoring his identity and memories. Tears streamed down his face as he recounted the hardships of living as a muggle, forgotten by the world he once knew. Thank you, truly, thank you, he whispered, acknowledging the end of his life was near. In my final moments, you've given me back my identity. For that, I am eternally grateful. 
Though the old wizard had regained his memories, he remained in the twilight of his life, a life that had been marked by loss and struggle. Yet, in his final days, he found solace in remembering who he once was, thanks to the kindness of strangers. Living a life akin to that of a vagabond had taken its toll on him, pushing his body to its very limits. No. Mr. Carlos, as long as I'm here, you won't die, Blake assured, presenting a bottle of potion with a hopeful gesture. This is a potion formula I've developed myself. Please drink it if you trust me. The potion, designed to extend life, not only delayed aging, but also boosted vitality. Skeptical, the old wizard doubted the efficacy of a magic potion concocted by someone so young. Yet Blake's earnestness made it difficult for him to decline the offer. Upon consuming the potion, the old wizard was taken aback by its immediate effects. A surge of strength, long absent, coursed through his frail body, and he sensed his dwindling magical powers beginning to rejuvenate. Observing the transformation, Blake noticed a renewed spark in the wizard's eyes, a clear sign of his rekindled will to live. At that moment, a notification rang in Blake's mind. Ding! A potential follower has been detected. Would the host like to include him? This was the eye of truth at work. As Blake watched, the aura above the old wizard's head shifted from white to gold, a smile creeping onto Blake's face. This was precisely why he had embarked on his journey. Contrary to what some believed, Lockhart's book wasn't entirely fabricated. Many of the adventures it recounted were based on truth. How could a wizard capable of such feats be considered weak? System, proceed with the inclusion, Blake commanded, ready to welcome the old wizard into his fold. This encounter underscored the essence of his quest, to uncover hidden truths and potential allies in the most unexpected places.